good evening, everyone. I am Evangelist Clarissa Wright. It is a blessing and honor to journey through the scriptures with you this evening. We will um, be continuing on in the book of Galatians, looking at chapter three. Before we begin, we cer certainly want to ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide as he is the vessel, as he is the leader, I am merely the vessel. Shall we pray? Father, we come before your throne this day, giving you praise, honor, and glory. We ask that you would remove anything from within us that is not like you. Give us a clean heart and renew a right spirit in us that we may rightly divide your word of truth. I pray that you would give each person, Father, this day that which they need to continue to stand firm in the faith, that we may run the race that you have set before us looking to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. We give you all praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Just a few housekeeping tips. Um, I will be reading from the new King James Version. Um, I will also be looking at this chapter in sections and chunks. For example, I will start off by looking at uh, verses one through nine. And, and prior to reviewing the sections with you, there will be five uh, sections. Um, I will, of course, read uh, the verses um, that we will be reviewing, okay? And so with that, let's um, jump right in. So as I said, uh, the first section will be Galatians uh, verses one through nine. And so I shall now read that. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you, all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So first, let's just talk a little bit about Abraham. So we will kind of focus on the end of these verses first, looking at verses six through nine, and then we will go back um, to verses one through five. Abraham was the father of faith and his story, uh, the meat of his story, that is, begins in Genesis chapter 12. In chapter 12, Abraham is called uh, by God to leave all that he knows, to leave the land, the countrymen, to leave his family behind and to journey to a land he doesn't know. So Abraham takes his wife, Sarai at the time, uh, Lot and his servants. And again, he journeys trusting and believing in the Lord and again, um, goes off to a place that he doesn't know. In Genesis chapter 15, um, Abraham and God are having a conversation and, and Abraham is saying at this time, he doesn't have a child. He's an elderly man. He doesn't expect to have a child. So he's um, believing that perhaps um, someone in his household, one of his servants will be his heir. And the Lord says to him, um, no, you will um, bear a son. There will be a seed that comes from you and he will inherit uh, your all of your property. Abraham believed God, again, despite the fact that he was an elderly man and as was his wife, uh, Sarai, was an elderly woman at this point. And God accounted that to him for righteousness. Between chapters 15 and 22, Abraham and Sarah bear a son, and that son is Isaac. In chapter 22, the Lord tests Abraham, and he says to Abraham, um, I want you to take your son Isaac, and I want you to put him 
on a on the um on an altar and I want you to sacrifice him. Abraham, knowing the promises that the Lord had made with him, um, believing that through Isaac, many nations would be blessed, um, again, trusting the Lord, took Isaac, went um, to the mountain, laid Isaac on an altar and was preparing to sacrifice him. The Lord sending an angel saying, wait, wait, I now know that you truly do fear me. And then the Lord goes on to say to him in Genesis chapter 22, verses 17 and 18, blessing, I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand, which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Verse 18, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now we're going to come back to that term in verse 18 in your seed. But for now, we know that promises were made to Abraham by God. There was a covenant that was established, but most and, and, and more importantly for Abraham, he believed God, he trusted, he, he moved in faith and that was accounted to him for righteousness. So these last verses, verses uh, six through nine in the section that I just read, it goes on to talk about, again, the fact that, that um, Abraham's faith was accounted to him for righteousness. Again, it was his believing. God said, go to another land. He did. God said, even though you're elderly, you're going to bear a son. Abraham believed him. The Lord said, I want you to take your son and put him on an altar and sacrifice him. Abraham, knowing that God had said that through Isaac, um, many nations would come. In spite of that, Abraham trusted the Lord and was doing as God had called him. All of this was Abraham walking and acting in faith. And what these last uh, verses in verses one through nine say to us, as we look at verses six through nine, again, seven goes on to say, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So again, we are to walk in faith as Abraham did. The Lord introduced this concept of trusting and obeying and, and walking in faith via Abraham. Verse eight, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, we being Gentiles, if you are not um, a, a, a Jew, you are a Gentile. So those of us who are um, not of the Jewish family are Gentile. And the Lord said that we would be justified by faith, just as Abraham was. And thus it was preached to Abraham. So this introduction of salvation by faith came eons and eons ago. Amen. And so if we walk in faith, then we are the children, if you will, of Abraham, just as the scripture says. Now, going back to the beginning, understanding that the Gentiles salvation is to come by faith, just as Abraham walked in faith. We go back, the Galatians likewise were Gentiles. Paul had gone to the churches in Galatia and preached salvation by faith. Well, an enemy had come in in the middle of that and began to preach and tell them that they needed to do things in order to gain salvation. You need to be circumcised. You need to do this. You need to do that. And Paul, hearing this, was very frustrated because now the Galatians, rather than obeying what what Paul had taught them were now obeying what the, what this enemy had now um, thrown in and began to confuse them about. So now Paul is challenging them. You started off this journey on faith. You can't now turn and now try to um, gain salvation by works. We'll never gain salvation by works. We'll never be justified enough before the Lord. He is too righteous he is too just. And the Lord knew that. So he created an avenue for us as Gentiles to come in. And that avenue was salvation by faith. Amen. So that is basically what the verses one through nine of Galatians is telling us is that again, Paul was frustrated with the church of the, 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 the churches in Galatia who were Gentiles because now they think that somehow they're going to be able to gain salvation by the works. And that simply is never going to happen because that is not how God ordained for it to happen um, since the beginning. 
And again, we as Gentiles, that is how we enter into salvation by faith and by faith alone. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to begin to look at verses 10 through 14 of chapter three, verses 10 through 14. And this goes on to read for as many as are of the works of the law are under the, are under the curse for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things, which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Again, now we're going to start looking at verse 10 and we'll work our way forward to verse 14. So verse 10 is telling us that if you believe that you can get salvation by works, you're under a curse. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Again, you're under a curse. You will never be able to... Uh, fulfill, uh, um, get salvation by works. It, it just will not happen. Deuteronomy 27, 26 tells us that cursed is everyone who does not uphold the works of this law by carrying them out. It, it's a curse. So you don't want to try to get salvation by, by works. It, it simply, um, my brothers and sisters will never happen. Um, we would never be able to please God by our works or by a moral law. It just would not happen because um, our, our efforts could never measure up to God's standard. It just wouldn't happen. We are too, God is too just for us. God is too good for us. And you can't be selective about it. In other words, well, since I'm a nice person, even though maybe I say a swear word here and there, since I'm a nice person, that should um, get me in. Or since I give all my goods to the poor, even though I made this mistake years ago, no, everything would have to be perfect. And we know that there is only one perfect person that walked this earth, and that is Jesus Christ. The rest of us fall short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us that if any man says that he is, has not sinned, he is a liar and the truth of God is in him. So we need Christ. We need a savior. The law simply would not work for us. We need to be able to get to God by faith and faith alone. The Lord, uh, the Lord of course knew that and paved that way for us. And again, showed us that that was how it was going to occur way back with Abraham. Now going on, the scripture says, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. This is verse 11 for the, for the just shall live by faith. Again, as I just said, God is too righteous. He's too just. We would never be able to uphold the law. We would constantly, constantly, constantly fall short for all have fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 12, Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. If you're going to try to live by the law, which you can't, you have to get everything right. Again, that would never happen. And the Lord seeing that had mercy upon us. He had mercy upon us. Amen. So again, the just shall live by faith. What did Jesus say to his disciples in Matthew chapter 16? Well, he first he asked them, who do the people say that I am? Then he went on and asked his disciples, okay, forget the people. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter piped up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. Again, it is uh, the Lord re reveals himself. It is, we don't get salvation by the things that we do. It is by our faith and our faith 
alone. Amen. What does Romans 10 9 tell us? That if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Again, it's not about some title that you have behind your name. It's not about being a nice person. It's not about going to every service that your church has by going to Bible study or, or you know, what have you. It's not about any of that, giving your goods to the poor, about being, a, uh, uh, being able to prophesy, about having dreams and being able to interpret it. It's not about any of any of that. Those are our blessings. And we certainly want to tie so that we can, you know, continue to advance the church. We certainly want to um, do, you know, whatever gifts that we have for the church. If you can prophesy, you want to do that to advance the church. We certainly want to um, usher and, and teach and things of that nature. But those aren't how you are saved. You are saved by your belief in Christ and your belief in Christ alone. Amen. Amen. Verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. I'm going to skip the um, part that's in parentheses, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Christ redeemed us. Amen. All we have to do is believe that he is King of King and Lord of Lords, and you are sealed until that mighty day. Amen. Now the part that's in parentheses says, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. There is a scripture in back in Genesis, and I don't know that I um, still have that scripture in front of me, but there is a scripture that talked about, um, when a person um, back again in, in the Old Testament, when they died, if someone, if you killed someone, then essentially your body was put on a tree and you were hung on a tree. And essentially that's what Christ did for us. Christ was put on a tree, i.e. the cross, and he hung on that cross and he bore all our sins because he was the perfect sacrifice. Again, remember, he has, he lived a perfect life. He made no mistakes. He was that perfect lamb, that lamb that had no blemish whatsoever. And so he hung high on that old rugged cross. He bore your sins. He bore my sins. He bore our iniquities. So that now he becomes a gateway for us to get back to God because without him, there would be no way for us. Amen. So that essentially is what this scripture is telling us is that Jesus bore our sins. He became that curse for us. So now that we can now um, make it, make our way home back to glory. Again, that is salvation by faith, not salvation by works, because all we're doing is believing. Amen. Amen. So now we're going to go and look at the next um, section, the third section, and that would be verses 15 through 18. And I just want to back up and I want to say that, thank God that Christ uh, bore that um, that curse for us because 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So there's freedom. You don't have to worry about the mistakes that you've made. You don't have to worry about that you said something that you shouldn't have said, that you did something. Even Paul said that I failed to do the things that I wish I would do, and I do the things that I wish I wouldn't do. We are imperfect people, but praise be to God that the Lord, knowing that, made a way for us to get back home to him. Amen. Amen. And so now let's go on and look at verses 15 through 18. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant, yet it is confirmed. No one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed who is Christ. And this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, that it should be, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Amen. The Lord gave it to Abraham by promise. Again, 
We're now going to go back, starting with verse 15, and we'll um, work our way to verse 18. So verse 15 is essentially just giving you an example, and it's talking about a contract. Again, brethren, I speak in the manner of men, meaning I let me give you an example um, of, of something that you do. And so now they're talking about a contract. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet is if it is confirmed, no one knows or adds. So covenant or contract. So think about the covenant as being a contract. So if I decide to um, have a house built and I enter into a contract with um, a builder, we're going to talk about the specifications of the house. We're going to talk about the layout of the kitchen, how many bedrooms I want, you know, what, how, however other many rooms I want in the house, what I want the house to look like. And that is going to, and we're going to enter into a contract, a contract that I'm going to sign and the builder's going to sign. And once we sign that contract, that piece of paper, I can't then go back and on my own, unilaterally on my own, try to change something. The builder can't come back on, on his own and unilaterally on his own, try to change something. We've entered into a contract and that contract is binding. And essentially that is what this is saying here, that the Lord has entered into a contract with Abraham and that contract is binding. And that contract was a promise. And so the law can't now come in and change what God promised Abraham well before the law showed up. Amen. So now let's look at verse 16, which says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to your seed, who is Christ. Again, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. So now I'm going to take you back to Genesis chapter 22, verse 18, when I said, we're going to come back to that verse. And that verse reads, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, I will say to you, depending on the version of the Bible you have, it may not say seed. Again, I have the New King James Version, so it says seed, and that's important because it's focusing on one. I know that some other versions have offspring. Some other versions have descendants. And so um, that can be a little bit confusing because again, as we look at verse 16 of chapter three, it says now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Remember, Abraham had more children. Had, had, we know it had at least another son, but the promise for Abraham at the time in his mind was to come through one seed and that seed was for Abraham, Isaac. But this scripture is telling us that spiritually, it was not Isaac. Spiritually, that seed, that one seed was Christ, was the Messiah. Car Clarissa, where are you getting that? Well, it's saying that to us right here, because as we read verse 16, again, I will read it again. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, Again, as some of the um, verses will say descendants, uh, but as of many, but as of one and to your seed, who is Christ? So essentially, as we talked about, a promise was made to Abraham. Abraham not perhaps fully understanding that promise when, when God said to him that in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. That seed that he was referring to was actually not Isaac. It was actually um, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so the word is telling us that now in Galatians chapter three, verse 16. We don't have to guess, go look around. The Lord is tying it together for us. The scripture is tying it together for us and telling us that that seed was actually the Messiah. That's who um, the Lord was referring to when he was speaking to Abraham eons ago. Of course, Abraham wouldn't have known that. He, We can only know what we, um, the information that we're equipped with, amen, at the time. And for Abraham, it might have been Isaac, but for the Lord, he was prophesying about the Messiah coming because the Lord knew that we would need a savior. Amen.
Verse 17, and this I say, that the law, which was 430 years ago, years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Again, the promise to Abraham came before the law. Abraham and the covenant, we're talking about the book of Genesis. Amen. Then we know Moses comes after that. So now Moses comes after the Exodus and the laws come along with Moses. So the promise to Abraham um, that you will that you will inherit um, all the nations of the earth, that promise comes well before the laws show up. Amen. And so what this scripture is saying is just that, that the law cannot come back, come and get rid of what God had already established with Abraham. As I said in the beginning of this section, when you enter into a contract, neither side can annul, can get rid of that contract. When you enter into that contract, that contract is binding. And praise be to God that unlike man, when God says that he had says that something's going to happen, it cannot return void. If the Lord said it's going to happen, it is going to happen, period. And again, this covenant with Abraham, these promises came before the law came. Amen. And so again, verse 18 goes on to say, for if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise. If the inheritance is of the law, now we have to work for it. The Lord promised it. There was, there were no if, and, but, quit, pro, quos. This is a promise. And therefore the law cannot come in and change that. But God, as it ends, gave it to Abraham by promise promise. It is not what we do. There is nothing that we can do. There are no, there are no merits. It's not about our personality. Oh, she's a nice person. Oh, she, she's a nasty person. What God is looking at is what is in your heart. Have you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is King of King and Lord of Lords? And have you confessed that? That is what matters, my brothers and sisters, at the end of the day, not all of this other stuff. We want to do it because certainly when we um, help others, when we show love, when we walk in love, that is the outward expression is showing what is in our heart. But at the end of the day, it's your belief in Christ that matters because we know that there are people who walk around and will help people, will do things, will help the poor, will give money here and there, and they deny Christ. They're not going to see heaven. The word tells us that you must confess that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Amen. So now I know that you're wondering, well, if that's the case, then what's, you know, what's the purpose of the law? You know, what, if, if, if it's all about faith, if all I have to do is believe, then what is the purpose of the law? That's a good question. And guess what? We're about to jump into that because now we're going to look at sections 25, 19, I believe through uh, 25 verses 19 through 25. So let's um, see if we can figure that question out. And it starts in verse 19 by saying, what purpose then does the law serve? It was added, it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But under faith, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. 
So what was the purpose of the law? The purpose was a guide. The, 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 the purpose was for the law to be a guide for us. It was added because of our transgressions. How would we know what is right and what is wrong? So the law said, this is what is right. You are to, um, serve the, you are to, to serve the Lord only. You are to put no one else before him. You are to honor your father and mother. You are to be the husband of one wife. You are not to, um, um, murder. You are not to covet what your neighbors have. There was a law to help us to understand this is what, what you should do. This is what is right. And this is what is wrong. So it served as a guide. That is merely all that the law did. Now that faith has come now that we're under this grace age. I know that some of you are saying, well, then that means, does that mean that I don't have to abide by the law? No. That does not mean that you don't have to abide by the law. As a matter of fact, I can tell you that Romans 6 15 says, what then shall we sin because we are not under law, but under um, grace? Certainly not. As I said before, uh, my apologies. As I said before, we are to abide. We want to do our best to honor God and our, our appearance should really reveal what is in our heart. So how do we do that? Well, we know what the laws are. So we do our best to abide by them, but knowing that we will never be able to, um, be, we, we can't be justified um, by the law because we will never um, we, we will never fully fulfill that. We will always make mistakes. We will always do something wrong. Even if you're not actually physically doing something wrong, if you're thinking wrong, the scripture tells us even to think wrong is a sin. Amen. Even to think wrong. So you may not actually follow out the act, but you thought it as such you sin. So God is too just for us. God is too righteous for us. So again, the law just came as a guide and the law helped to show us that we needed a savior, which is why it goes on to say when we look at verse 22, but the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law kept for the faith, which would be afterward, which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, to help us to understand that we needed a savior. We would never be able to meet all the demands of, of, of the Lord. When we stand before God, if we stood before God's salvation by law, we would fail time and time and time again. None of us would ever be able to measure up to God's standard because he is too perfect. We are too imperfect. So the law showed us that we needed a savior. We needed someone to come in. We needed someone to mediate on our, our behalf. We needed someone to be able to be that bridge, that gap because of our sinful flesh. And so the law basically is letting us know, look, you need a savior. You're never going to get all of this right as much as you try. Amen. Amen. So that was the purpose of the law to help us to understand one, that we need a savior and two, to be a guide. In other words, I get, I'm driving and I see a stop sign. I need to abide by that stop sign. If I don't abide by that stop sign, guess what? I've um, broken a law. Well, what if I'm in a rush? I'm, I need to get to the hospital. I, I need to, you know, something's going on. If I brush past that stop sign and I don't stop, haven't I still sinned? Well, praise be to God that we have a, have a savior. Amen. 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 And so now when we look at the last verses of this chapter, verses 26 through 29, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Again, as we talked about from the beginning, Paul showed up and he said to the um, churches in Galatia, said to the churches in Galatia that are you trying to now get salvation by works? When I showed up and I said to you, all you have to do is believe. Why would you want to do that? So again, if we want to be sons for you, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. That is how we get salvation, not through works, not through anything else. And Jesus Christ again is our savior. 
For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the purpose. Abraham was accounted, his, his faith was accounted to him for, right, for righteousness. And how do we get to God by our faith in Jesus Christ and our faith alone? Again, not by anything that we do, not by a title that's behind our name, not by our personality, um, none of that. It's by our faith and our faith in Jesus Christ alone. And I do just want to read Romans 10, 9, and I can never um, remember Romans uh, 10, 10. So I do, do just want to go to that scripture for us. So we know that Romans 10, 9 says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Romans 10, 10 says, for with the heart, one believes, amen, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And listen, just with anything, when you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, when you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, it's just like anything. There is a heart change. You become a new creature. Old things are passed away. Become, behold, all things become new. It's just like with anything. You have a child. You fall in love. You're, you, you want to please that person. And sometimes your behavior changes and you don't even realize you're not conscious of the change. You're doing it because of the love that you have for that, for that person, for those people. That's what happens with Christ. When we accept Christ into our heart, there is a heart chant transplant. We aren't necessarily, uh, always conscious of it, but it happens because that's what happens when we fall in love. So so remember, my brothers and sisters, that it is about salvation. Our sa salvation comes through faith and faith alone. It does not come through works. There is nothing that you can do. So when you make a mistake, if you believe in Christ, you ask the Lord to forgive you, you get up, you brush off your feet and you keep it moving. Amen. Because salvation is by faith and faith alone. And the word tells us that, and I, and I can't remember the scripture, but the word tells us that we are sealed. So once you believe, you are sealed. Jesus said that he had not lost any disciples. And he went on to say that he's also going to have others that will be coming to him. And he's not going to lose any of them as well. Amen. Because we are sealed. We are sealed until that mighty day. Amen. So again, I hope that um, this journey was um, helpful for you. I hope that you uh, learned something in this lesson. Um, I know that I did. I thank God. I thank the Holy Spirit for um, the revelations. Um, I it helped. It really helped me to gain a better understanding and really to be able to talk about salvation. Um, by faith versus salvation by works, um, more, uh, more clearly. Again, we are in the age, we are salvation by faith. Nothing that you can do. Amen. Nothing that you can do. Just believe. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you. We give you honor and glory for your word. We thank you, Father God, for revelation. We thank you, Lord, that you are king and that your word cannot fail. We thank you, Father God, that your word cannot return void. If you said it, then it's going to happen. If it doesn't happen, then you didn't say it. So praise be to God, Father God, that again, your word cannot return void. We thank you for your son. We thank you that you put your only begotten son on the cross that we might be able to um, um, connect, rejoin with you again. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And Lord, if there is anyone here who is hurting, who is seeking guidance, Father, I pray for their pain. I pray for encouragement. I pray for guidance for them, Father God. I pray for anyone who is sick. I pray, Father God, that by your stripes, they will be healed. We just give you all the praise. We give you all the glory, all the honor. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray pray. Amen. Amen and amen.